subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. I uh, want to start today uh, talking about uh, multilateralism. The Trump administration wants multilateral institutions to function, to actually work. Uh, but multilateralism, just for the sake of it, just to get together in a room and chat, doesn't add value. That brings me to the International Criminal Court, a thoroughly broken and corrupted institution. The United States has never ratified the Rome Statute that created the court, and we will not tolerate its illegitimate attempts to subject Americans to its jurisdiction. In June, the Trump administration authorized the imposition of economic sanctions against foreign persons directly engaged in ICC efforts to investigate U.S. or allied personnel, and those who materially assisted in, those to, in, the, in that effort. Today, we take the next step because the ICC continues to target Americans, sadly. Pursuant to Executive Order 13928, the United States will designate ICC Prosecutor Fatou Ben Souda and the ICC's Head of Jurisdiction Complementarian Cooperation Division, Fakiso Mochichuko, for having material assisted Prosecutor Ben Souda. Individuals and entities that continue to materially support those individuals risk exposure to sanctions as well. Additionally, State Department has restricted the issuance of visas for certain individuals involved in the ICC's efforts to investigate U.S. personnel. On the multilateral front further, I look forward to seeing my ASEAN Indo-Pacific counterparts next week at a host of virtual meetings. We'll have discussions that will be wide-ranging, including on COVID, North Korea, South China Sea, Hong Kong, and Burma's Rakhine State. I'll also raise how the Trump administration is restoring reciprocity to the U.S.-China relationship. And today we continue that necessary work. For years, the Chinese Communist Party has imposed significant barriers on American diplomats working inside the PRC. Specifically, the Chinese Communist Party has implemented a system of opaque approval processes designed to prevent American diplomats from conducting regular business, attending events, securing meetings, and connecting with the Chinese people, especially on university campuses and via the press and social media. Today, I'm announcing the State Department has established a mechanism requiring approval for senior Chinese diplomats in the United States to visit university campuses and to meet with local government officials. Cultural events with groups larger than 50 people hosted by the Chinese Embassy and consular posts outside our mission properties will also require our approval. Additionally, we're taking further steps to ensure that all official PRC, embassy, and consular social media accounts are properly identified as government accounts, Chinese government accounts. I have David Stilwell, our Assistant Secretary of East Asia Pacific Affairs with me today. He'll take questions. We're simply demanding reciprocity. Access for our diplomats in China should be reflective of the access that Chinese diplomats in the United States have, and today's steps will move us substantially in that direction. Further on China, Under Secretary Kroc sent a letter recently to the governing boards of American universities, alerting them to the threats the Chinese Communist Party poses to academic freedom, to human rights, and to university endowments. These threats can come in the form of illicit funding for research, intellectual property theft, intimidation of foreign students, and opaque talent recruitment efforts. University governing boards can help ensure their institutions have clean investments and clean endowment funds by taking a few key steps. Disclose all PRC companies' investment in, invested in endowment funds, especially those in emerging market index funds. Divest from Chinese companies on the Commerce Department entity list that are contributing to human rights violations, military coercion, and other abuses. And simply understand the recommendations issued by the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, which examined the risk to investors of Chinese companies that are listed on U.S. stock exchanges. Staying on China, but moving beyond our borders, we're hoping for a peaceful resolution of the situation on the India-China border. From the Taiwan Strait to the Himalayas and beyond, the Chinese Communist Party is engaged in a clear and intensifying pattern of bullying its neighbors. That bullying is also evident in the South China Sea. Last week, the United States imposed sanctions and visa restrictions on Chinese individuals and entities responsible for the CCP's imperialism there. Doing things such as unlawful energy surveillance activities in the economic zones for allies, the Philippines, and other countries. 
We also remain concerned, we've talked about this before, the activities of more than 300 Chinese flagged vessels near the Galapagos, which are almost certainly engaged in illegal fishing. In light of this maritime lawlessness, it's no surprise that Beijing's candidate in the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea election last week received more abstentions than any other candidate. China is the most flagrant violator of the Law of the Sea Convention, and nations all across the world are registering their disapproval. We're also concerned about Chinese actions in Tibet in light of the General Secretary's recent calls to sinicize Tibetan Buddhism and fight splitism there. We continue to call upon Beijing to enter into dialogue with the Dalai Lama or his representatives without preconditions to reach a settlement that resolves their differences. We're also tracking the situation in Belarus closely. Deputy, Deputy Secretary Began traveled there uh, last week at my direction. Uh, Belarusians deserve the right to choose their own leaders through a truly free and fair election under independent observation. We demand an immediate end to the violence against them and the release of all who are unjustly detained and that includes U.S. citizen Vitaly Shirishikov. We're closely coordinating, too, with our transatlantic partners and are together reviewing significant targeted sanctions on anyone involved in human rights abuses and oppression. Turning to the Middle East, where I just got back from a productive trip and where we have senior officials there today. The region is changing rapidly thanks to President Trump's leadership building up ties between Israel and its neighbors. The Abraham Accords are clear proof of just that. So is the first ever direct flight from Tel Aviv to Abu Dhabi, which took place this week, and the first direct flight between Israel and Sudan, which I was honored to make during my trip. Additionally, at every stop, I urge my counterparts to stand united against the Islamic Republic of Iran's threats to the region, which leads to my next point. Forty years ago, Forty years ago this month, the Iranian regime arrested nine members of the Baha'i National Spiritual Assembly of Iran. No one has heard from them since. Sadly, we must conclude that these nine individuals met the same fate as the more than 200 other Iranian Baha'is who, who have been executed for peace of, peacefully practicing their faith. We ask the international community, when will Iran's regime be held accountable for those crimes? In Africa, we welcome the news that Sudan's civilian-led transitional government initiated a historic peace agreement with several opposition groups. That's good news. They suggested to me when I was visiting them that would likely occur. Good on them. And here close at home in the Western Hemisphere, the United States candidate Mauricio Claver Caron is the right person for the presidency of the International Development Bank. The vote, currently scheduled for September 12th, should not be delayed. It should happen that day. And on Venezuela, 34 countries have now joined the growing list the growing international consensus in favor of a transitional government. More and more nations know that the fraudulent National Assembly election scheduled, for, scheduled by Maduro for December 6th of this year will neither be fair, fair nor free. And we also call on free and fair elections in Haiti as soon as technically feasible. And with that, I'm happy to take a handful of questions today. Uh, okay, uh, let's start Vivian. Yeah. Great. Right. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your decision to address the RNC from Jerusalem. Uh, there was guidelines sent to State Department staff uh, advising against participation in any partisan politics. And so um, what message does that send to the men and women of the State Department? Also, obviously, the House um, Foreign Affairs Committee is, has, has raised this issue as part of its uh, complaint against you. And so if you can address all those issues, please. All I can say in my role as Secretary of State uh, I did this in my personal capacity. All I can say in my role as Secretary of State is the State Department reviewed this, was lawful, and I personally felt it was important that the world hear the message of what this administration has accomplished. Christine, thank you. Um, the yearly U.S. government China report, uh, military China report yes, came out yesterday. yesterday. It said that uh, China intends to double its nuclear uh, warheads by in the next 10 years um, and grow its global and uh, naval presence. Uh, how do you think the U.S. and its allies should respond, and what do you think is the most alarming trend uh, of China's military? So what was in that report yesterday doesn't come to as news to anyone who's been following this issue for uh, the past years. This administration is the first one that has truly called out the Chinese Communist Party for this military aggression, this buildup that has undertaken, and then, of course, responded to it. Uh, we've done a number of things. First, the president's put the largest defense budgets in American history 
in front of Congress and they've passed it, 700 and plus billion dollars, uh, two years running. So we're making sure that America has the tools it needs to respond to any threat, including threats that emanate from the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, second, on particular pieces of this, I'll give you an example, the, the nuclear weapons. We have implored the Chinese to be part of our strategic dialogue. We've, we've suggested it's in their best strategic interest, it's in our best strategic interest, it's in the world's strategic interest to reduce the risk from these most dangerous weapon systems. And uh, we're in productive conversations with the Russian on this very thing. If the Chinese Communist Party is serious about participating on the global stage and being a nation of size and scale that is part of this community, then it has an obligation. When you build out a nuclear arsenal with the kind of missile testing, more missile tests in China last year than I think all Western nations combined. If you're, if you're going to be serious, you have to, you have to use those in a way that is consistent with how nations undertake their obligations under the nuclear proliferation treaties and all those obligations, uh, written, unwritten, signed and unsigned, and then they should enter in these strategic conversations. Well, we want to make sure that the, the risk of using those weapon systems in particular is diminished. And we, we stand ready to have them join this conversation with the Russians. I hope that they will. Nice. Secretary, um, a deputy to President Erdogan just said that Washington partial lifting of arms sale to Cyprus will agitate the conflict in the eastern of the Mediterranean. How do you respond to that and how do you assess uh, Turkey's influence in the Middle East? And on Lebanon, sir, if I can, um, the French president just wrapped a visit to Beirut. He met with all political leaders, yet we have Assistant Secretary David Schenker in Beirut, and he did not meet with any political leaders. Is this a message? Um, and are you coordinating with the French on any initiative? So as for Lebanon, we're certainly in close conversations with the French. We shared the same objective. Uh, Ambassador uh, Hale was in Beirut uh, several weeks back now. He met with a number of political leaders. Uh, the objective is the same. Business as usual in Lebanon just is unacceptable. I think President Macron said the same thing. Uh, this, this has to be uh, a government that con conducts significant reforms, real change. It's what the people of Lebanon are demanding. And the United States is going to use its diplomatic presence and its diplomatic capabilities to make sure that we get that outcome. I think the French share that. I think the whole world, frankly, sees the risk. Look, the, the risk stares you in the face. Missile systems, precision guided missions that the Hezbollah holds in the south. Uh, we all remember the history of Lebanon. Everybody disarms, but Hezbollah. Uh, th this is the challenge that is presented. And so those people who are either part of that or are playing footsie with Hezbollah should know that that's not productive. It's not what the people of Lebanon want, and it's not what the regional security situation demands. So I'm confident that the United States, the French, and all of us who are working there on the ground, both uh, to meet the immediate needs and the result as that, that flowed from the uh, explosion that took place now several weeks back, as well as the longer-term challenges that are presenting in Lebanon. We'll all work on it together. And on Turkey? Uh, you, asked, you asked about the decision we made yesterday, or announced yesterday, with respect to Cyprus. It's been a long time coming. Uh, we've been working on this for an awfully long time. Uh, we, we know that this uh, decision was announced in light of uh, heightened tensions in the eastern Mediterranean, but we thought it was the right thing, and so I made the decision we would move forward with it on the timeline that uh, our decision was reached. President Trump's been in conversations with President Erdogan. He's spoken to the Prime Minister in Greece. Uh, we're urging everyone to stand down to reduce tensions and begin to have diplomatic discussions about the conflicts that exist there in the Eastern Mediterranean, the security conflicts, the energy resource conflicts, the maritime conflicts. They need to sit down and have conversations about this and resolve this diplomatically. It is not useful to increase military tension in the region. Uh, only, only negative things can flow from that. I'll take, I'll take a couple more. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mr. Hi. Um, how do you justify the U.S. not joining the WHO-led COVAX effort uh, to provide a vaccine globally when more than 170 other countries have joined? There is no nation that has been or will be as deeply committed to delivering vaccines all around the world as the United States of America, the, not just in terms of dollars. We will dwarf every nation in terms of the financial resources, the goodness of the American people uh, to give our money to make sure that these vaccines are delivered all around. No nation will match us. It will, won't even be close. Uh, but it is also imperative that when we do that, we need to do, do so in a way that's effective. It's not political. That is science-based. And what we have seen demonstrated from the World Health Organization that it is not that. 
Jose. Yes, uh, it's a question on Mexico. Uh, U.S. energy groups have written letters to you and others in the administration expressing concerns about developments in the energy sector in Mexico. They complain about the lack of legal certainty, investors' rights for U.S. companies in Mexico uh, taken uh, by actions taken by the Mexican government. What is the Trump administration willing to do to defend U.S. interests in Mexico in the energy sector? And has this been recent to the presidential level? You know, most importantly, I'm familiar with this issue. We, we want American companies to have the opportunity to invest out of Mexico. It's what the USMCA was designed to achieve. We think there's been real progress there. <clears throat> but make, make no mistake, we've been clear. Uh, this isn't about, you, you talked about what we do to defend American interests down there. This is in Mexico's best interest. <laughs> it's in Mexico's best interest to have American investment, the technology that is brought to develop Mexican energy resources to benefit the people of Mexico. And so we're in constant conversations with the Mexican government about this, certainly uh, at every level of the United States government. It's, it's important. We think this cooperative set of agreements that was reached between the United States, Canada, and Mexico can deliver on those outcomes in a way that NAFTA never could. And so we'll continue to work on that challenge. Thank you, Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. We'll keep still on here for a minute. Like Thank, Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Um, let's try to get to everybody who hasn't done yet. Yeah. Um, to talk about uh, uh, the if there's an escalation at the Indian-Chinese border, the LAC, where does the United States stand there? Uh, and uh, it also says uh, the Chinese foreign ministry has come up with a statement saying that the U.S. role in the cause for Tibet um, is the cause for Tibet. Uh, how do you respond to that? For the uh, conflict in the Himalayas, uh, like all things, especially uh, related to the PRC's uh, differences of opinion with its neighbors, is we advise them to return to dialogue, resolve these things peacefully without coercion, use of force. That, that applies to uh, the many conflicts that are going on in China's periphery right now. You mentioned Tibet. Uh, Xinjiang, uh, very concerned still about what they're doing there. Uh, Hong Kong activities, South China Sea, I could go on and on. Uh, what we've seen since the um, since the uh, corona outbreak from Wuhan uh, is it seems the PRC is trying to take advantage of the situation. And India, I think, is one of those uh, examples of that. So, you know, to our friends in Beijing, I would ask them to follow their commitment to resolve these things through peaceful means and dialogue. Just to follow up, in case there's an escalation, uh, will uh, the U.S. share intelligence with India? Will, will they assist India? We'll defer, defer that question to uh, others who are more closely uh, related to the Indian part. Nick, go ahead. Thanks, David, for doing this. Um, since we have you, can you just explain why you think this move that the Secretary announced is, is necessary? And as you know, as, as a former military man, there are uh, service members' pensions that also have uh, Chinese companies in them, and, and if you could address that. Uh, and then just while we have you on Taiwan, uh, is there support uh, from the Department of State on a free trade uh, agreement and those talks? And uh, did Taiwan's recent easing of beef and pork uh, imports ease, uh, shall we say, some internal opposition, uh, maybe outside this building, to those talks? Great questions. On the Taiwan question, uh, especially on the trade aspect, I will gladly defer to USTR on that one. However, uh, we did announce, though, that um, Under Secretary Kroc would begin a uh, economic dialogue with the uh, with Taiwan to look for those areas. As you saw, we moved the uh, TSMC um, chip manufacturing into Arizona, or we're moving in that direction, which is great news, uh, both for the U.S. and for Taiwan. So we're early on in this 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 uh, new uh, position, but it's very welcome decision out of President Tsai uh, to remove one of those last uh, obstacles. Uh, as far as TSB, uh, you, you heard the secretary mention again a letter from Keith Kroc to universities to better understand what your money is going into, where your endowments are being funded, and understand about the need for transparency on those things. As you know, uh, Chinese companies uh, in, in investing in the U.S. are not subject to the same audit restrictions that any other company. Uh, and then when we tell the Chinese that they do need to submit themselves, subject themselves to those requirements, they complain that be, they're being treated unfairly somehow. And so. Uh, you know, let's, as they say, you know, make truth, uh, seek truth through facts. Let's clarify all this and make the words and the reality match. Finally, on the, um, 
the announcement the Secretary just made about reciprocity. This is not new. We've been doing this since last uh, October, as you remember. We asked the Chinese diplomats uh, to notify us about their travels to all these locations, to see governors, mayors, school boards, uh, all these other things that we know they're doing. And we did that in an effort not to reduce the uh, relationship interaction, but to get them to understand that we are going to insist on getting this relationship back in balance because it is clearly uh, way out of balance. And balance, to me, equates to stability and that uh, the instability in this relationship causes all of us concern. We're taking steps to fix that. Thanks. Here, uh, sir, thank you for being here to answer our questions. So, as you know, the Chinese pretty much always respond in kind whenever the U.S. places sanctions or some sort of new restrictions. Uh, so what are you anticipating this time? And can you give us a sense where this is all leading? And are you already starting to prepare some particularly stiff sanctions to be enforced after September 20th, since they've made it clear they will not uh, go along with uh, U.N. sanctions on Iran? Let me talk to the, uh, uh, the anticipated PRC response. Um, I depend on, on you all, I mean, I mean that sincerely, uh, to help people understand that what they're doing uh, is grossly out of proportion to our simple desire to, re to balance this, this relationship. And, and so we have seen, I, we've seen both. We've seen sometimes where they have um, understood that this was long overdue and, and there's been no response. And especially in terms of media, uh, they have taken some very unfortunate steps of late uh, and they continue to do things to uh, media in the PRC, especially those reporters who understand what's going on, those with language skills and those who investigate uh, issues they would rather not, uh, the world not know. Um, Finances of elites uh, got New York Times and Bloomberg in big trouble when I was out there in 2011, 2012. Uh, most recently, the Wall Street Journal published a, a ba very balanced op-ed that was titled Sick Man of Asia, and that they bounced two Americans and an Australian for that. And so if there's concerns about reciprocal, uh, what they call reciprocal uh, retaliation is a better word, um, let's make sure we paint a very clear picture of what is what they're what they're doing, what that real balance looks like. You know, there's 150 or more um, Chinese diplomats here. I mean, they're Chinese uh, state media folks who work for the uh, Ministry of Propaganda here in the U.S. operating, you know, without restriction. Uh, and uh, there's only a handful of American journalists left in China right now. Let's let's paint that picture so everybody understands what we're talking about. Thanks. Um, can you comment on the possible impact of China blocking the export of artificial intelligence and its fallout with the possible sale of the American branch of TikTok? And also, are you concerned about um, the announcement that there are going to be um, increased COVID tests throughout Hong Kong? Apparently, there's concern among activists that this would be used for DNA collection. To your, your second question, I can't speak to what the intentions are in Hong Kong. I have noted uh, folks in Hong Kong are uh, having, uh, they have concerns, as you would imagine. Both your questions are related because they deal with information uh, and China's collection of that. Uh, for an analog, though, I would point you back to before we had the so-called vocational training centers, the, you know, the Uyghur internment camps. Uh, we had mass genetic uh, testing, and it was, it, it was massed, it was portrayed as health checks for Uyghurs and say they were collecting DNA on Uyghurs under the guise of doing health checks. So the, given that example, I think the Hong Kong people are rightly concerned. And then as far as uh, the TikTok and AI, uh, again, I'm not a, an expert on tech, but I do know that information is the new currency. It's like oil. It's, it's something everybody can use and needs and all that. But in a country that does run uh, under the auspices of rule of law, I think people can trust that their information will be used for good things and not for nefarious outcomes. You know, the PRC doesn't have that reputation. We know what they do with information. Uh, they target individuals with it. Uh, if you, it's the greatest state security apparatus anybody's ever seen. Anybody's been there, every street corner, not just one camera, it's got like eight on every corner. And so we, we know that we use facial recognition and all those things to affect your social credit score, to uh, affect your ability to get a job or put your kids into school. So I think the Hong Kong people are rightfully, rightfully concerned. Anybody else? Yeah. Can I, can I follow up on that? So just, just to try and 
uh, get to TikTok specifically. I know that there's only so much you can say, but you know, as, as Kim mentioned, the Chinese changed the export rules over the weekend, and it seems that that may stop a sale uh, to a U.S. company. Do you believe that the Chinese are trying, or do you believe it will stop a sale to a U.S. company uh, in the sense that the new rules essentially require ByteDance, the parent company, uh, to seek approval first? I think there's two forces at play here. Obviously, uh, the Chinese desire to prevent the U.S. from um, protecting itself by making sure that this um, software operates. I mean, we're not the first ones. Remember, uh, uh, India led off with this, with, and I think there are over 60 right now uh, apps uh, that are not available for use in India for the right reasons. I will point to the irony, though, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson using Twitter to say it's, un, it's completely out of bounds for the U.S. to block uh, you know, apps, Chinese apps in the U.S. on our own Twitter accounts. But uh, all that is to note that, um, again, I can't speak to the exact details, but there's an economic versus security balance here that, that we all have to deal with. And allowing the sale would allow, you know, the profits and, and all that to continue, whereas uh, blocking the sale, uh, obviously there's a financial loss, but a, um, uh, for the Chinese that should hopefully dampen their uh, their decision. Uh, I'm going to attempt to try the diet then. Let's see if it's working this week. We have Charlotte Lutherza from Epic Times. Is our dial working? Charlotte? Thank you. Thank you very much for Great. doing this call. Um, just to go back to the potential of the Taiwan deal, um, if the administration were to move forward with that, what kind of backlash would you anticipate from the Chinese regime on that? Again, yeah, second question about uh, Chinese response. That it's all about Beijing's decision matrix. But you know, our job is to obviously think through what those are and anticipate them. And if you look at the language from the three communiques in the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, the announcement we made earlier this week, the Economic relationship, cultural exchanges, all those things are fully allowed. There's nothing that prohibits those things. And so they should, there should be no lashback. You know, the, uh, the efforts to increase prosperity between the two countries should have no effect. Uh, I'm Kim. Uh, I'm from the JTBC, South Korea, the TV news channel. Uh, let me ask about North Korean issue. So you, a State Department issued an industry advisory on North Korea ballistic missile procurement yesterday. Yesterday, I'd like to know the background of it. Uh, have you found any specific signals such as North Korea trying to export their techniques or is it just a warning before it's a warning? I comment broadly on North Korea. Can I leave that to the Special Representative Steve Began and uh, Alex Wong? You definitely pose the questions if you want specifics on that. But I would note that uh, this administration has uh, done more. Like, my first tour as a military guy in, in Korea was in 1981. Uh, I've been you know, involved in this for quite a long time. And this administration has gone far further uh, than any other in uh, taking strong actions to let North Korea know that they're going to have to negotiate. They can't just sit back and threaten and launch and all the things they've been doing. And so this is another step in that direction is to demonstrate to North Korea that there is a brighter future for your people, uh, but you're going to have to uh, you know, step up and negotiate and, and talk about these things rather than remain isolated. Thank you. We're going to check the phone line one more time. Uh, we should have Susan Lee from Radio Free Asia. Sunman? You on the phone? Hello? Yes, yeah, uh, I'm on the phone. Yeah, um, I have a question about the cyber security threat from North Korea. So a few days ago, uh, the, the U.S. government issued several advisory against the North Korean cyber threat. So how do you assess the North Korean cyber threat in the way? I think we all remember the uh, Sony Pictures hack from 2014. Um, that was uh, Operation Deny Christmas for me and my family. <laughs> we spent every day thinking through that one. The, it is a, a clear threat. As you know, a lot of those cyber actors um, you know, are operating in other places in a dispersed manner. Uh, getting at this is going to be uh, difficult. Um, you know, we're, again, I'll defer to the folks in, in Homeland Security and who deal with the cyber threats specifically. Uh, but again, there's strong evidence that the, they do operate in that, in that regard. And the goal I find is to get 
currencies to get funding to continue with uh, missile procurement and the rest. So the, the quicker we can uh, slow or stop that, the better off we'll all be, safer we'll be. Anybody else in the room final? Speaking of, oh, we exhausted you. Great accomplishment. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Well, you could ask. You could ask. I mean, I'm going to ask about annexation, so you're oh, probably okay, best, cool. you're best qualified to answer it. What, what's that? your question, say? My question is that we are a little bit confused uh -huh. on the U.S. position on annexation of the West Bank. Because Mr. Kushner says one thing, Mr. Netanyahu says one thing, and the Secretary has not really clarified it. So can you explain to us your position on annexation? Is it, you know, as a result of uh, rapprochement or the normalization between UAE and Israel, has it been put off indefinitely? Uh, I, I have to look exactly at what we at what we said, but I believe that the government of Israel um, and uh, and uh, the secretary and Kushner, when we talked about the Abraham Accords, uh, said that it had. I think the word that we had used is postponed. Um, haven't given a, a timeline, um, but would just say that you know we still fundamentally believe the vision for peace that we put out in February. I think it was. Uh, is the right vision for peace for the Middle East. And we've seen by the first agreement between Arabs and Israelis in 25 years that this is um, the, the positive way forward that we hope for everybody in the Middle East, uh, Israelis, Palestinians, and we hope the Palestinian leadership um, will come to the table. And so we will see, we're making progress. And it was, uh, as the secretary said earlier, it was quite an honor and experience to be on the first flight last week uh, the first non-stop flight um, from Israel to Sudan. So that was a great moment. Okay, thanks, Saeed. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.